because the room appears to be full and we've only got until five o'clock before we have to uh, wrap up so I think we'll get started well first of all um, well I'm Lillian Greenwood I'm the Labour MP for Nottingham South and I chair the House of Commons Transport uh, Select Committee before I explain a bit about who we all are uh, and what we're doing here and more importantly get the opportunity for you to uh, speak I just want to introduce someone who's standing right at the back of the room and that is Gary, Gary Harp. And Gary is the Parliamentary Outreach Officer for the North West. So conscious that we've only got an hour to answer anything you might want to ask and that we've got a room full of people so we might not manage it. Gary's job is to uh, explain and answer questions about the role of Parliament and goes out to talk to community groups and schools across the whole of the North West explaining what Parliament is, what we do and how you can engage with it. So if by any chance we don't manage to deal with everything today, Gary has foolishly offered to be that point of contact. So I'm just be keeping an eye on him. He's not allowed to leg it before the end of the meeting. Right. Um, uh, now let me... overnight and come back tomorrow. <laughs> if only we could, but there's something tomorrow. rather pressing tomorrow. Yes. Okay, so I've already explained who I am. Um, let me let my colleagues also uh, introduce uh, themselves. Now I should just say before uh, I go any further, so on the Transport Select Committee there are actually in total 11 uh, members of the committee, so 10 uh, members plus me as chair. Unfortunately because there's quite a lot going on in Parliament at the moment, uh, there are only three, uh, there are only four of us here uh, today and that wasn't because the other members weren't interested, it was just because obviously there's a lot of pressing other matters uh, along and so sadly you've only got uh, three uh, Labour, four, uh, four Labour members uh, here today but actually we're a cross party uh, committee and we're very evenly balanced. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment but let me let my colleagues introduce themselves first. So Graham. Hi I'm Graham Morris, I'm a member of the Transport Select Committee and I'm the Labour MP for Easington in County Durham. Uh, Daniel Zeichner, also a member of the committee, obviously. I'm the Labour Member of Parliament for Cambridge. I'm Ruth Cadbury. I'm the Labour Member of Parliament for Brentford and Isleworth, which is in West London. Uh, I'm a new member of the committee, joining, I think, at the end of October, early November, uh, and I joined halfway through this bus inquiry um, had started. Okay, thanks, colleagues. Um, so there are another seven members of the committee who aren't here uh, today and overall the committee has got, it, it reflects the balance of power uh, in Parliament. So there are four Labour members, I'm the chair, I'm elected by all members uh, of Parliament and then the other members of the committee are elected by uh, their respective parties. There's one other Labour member who's not here today, Graeme Stringer from uh, Manchester. So there are four Labour members, four Conservative members, one SNP member and one uh, DUP member but you've only got a small group of us here today. Now one of the th great things uh, about being on the select committee is that we are supported by uh, a fantastic group of specialist parliamentary staff so they're not civil servants they're employed by parliament to support the work of the transport committee and uh, a number of them are here today so Debbie who's standing over there has been doing all the organising uh, for today thanks Debbie. Uh, then we've got Neris who's sitting over here uh, Neris is one of the people who manages our inquiry, she's the specialist and she's the person who's been managing our bus services inquiry, which is what brought us up here to Liverpool today. Uh, at the back is Ed, Ed's uh, what, what we call the second clerk, but he's another one of the specialist uh, committee staff and hiding somewhere uh, over here is Oliver, who's one of our media officers who kind of organises for us to get information about the committee into uh, the press and on telly and radio. So what, do, what does the Transport Select Committee do? So we're a parliamentary committee, uh, so we're set up by parliament, uh, we're cross party as you've already uh, heard, we are not the government. So if you ask us questions going why have the government done this, we might be able to explain but we're not responsible. Um, we're not the opposition either, so we're all backbench members uh, of parliament, so we're not kind of members of the you know, even though we're all Labour members, uh, none of us are Labour frontbenchers or spokespeople for the Labour Party on transport, even though uh, a couple of us have done that job in the past. The Select Committee's role is to scrutinise the Department for Transport and to hold them 
for accounts. So we can look at what money they're spending and why they're choosing to spend it in the way that they do. We can look at the administration, are they doing things the way they should be? Uh, and we can look at policy. And it applies to the Department for Transport, including its ministers, uh, and to the public bodies associated with the Department for Transport. So that's everything from Network Rail and the Highways England to the Civil Aviation Authority or things like DVLA. So quite a range of different uh, bodies that you'll have come across in, you know, and across different modes. So whether it's maritime, whether it's roads, whether it's railways, whether it's buses, whether it's walking and cycling, all of those things uh, we can scrutinise. The, set, the, the, the final thing I wanted to say really, which is that we choose what we do. So we're independent of government, we're independent of the opposition, we're set up by parliament and we choose the work that we're going to uh, inquire <coughs> into. So you've heard that today we were here as part of our inquiry uh, into buses, we've been looking at how buses are working across the country, what's going well, what's not going well, what should be uh, different. We've also got two other ongoing inquiries at the moment, one's looking at the state of local roads, potholes, one of the biggest issues people raise with me, I bet everybody in the room recognises that, that's one of our inquiries and we're looking at walking and cycling at the moment and what can be done uh, to make it easier for people to, uh, to walk and cycle for some of their journeys. You also might have seen some of our recent reports uh, on the telly or in the paper, so we did a big report into the rail timetabling chaos after the new rail timetables were introduced in May, obviously those had a massive impact up here uh, in the north, so we, we made some recommendations about uh, what, well, looked into what happened and made some recommendations to make sure it doesn't happen again and what should be done to put it right. We did a report into this in the last year, we did a report into community transport, we did a report into the collapse of the East Coast Rail franchise, the Virgin Stagecoach franchise. We did a big inquiry uh, into the decision that the government made about national um, <coughs> policy statement around airports, which basically was whether they should build a new uh, third runway at Heathrow Airport. Sometimes we're doing a long report that takes months, a long inquiry that takes months, and we hear uh, oral evidence sessions like we had earlier this afternoon <coughs> where we hear from witnesses. Sometimes we just do a one off session and don't produce a uh, a written report. The chances are the times when you've seen it is if we've had a minister in front of us and we're giving them uh, a good grilling. Now, this session we've got about another 50 minutes uh, and this is really your opportunity to ask us anything you'd like to about our work but also it's an opportunity for you to tell us about what you think or what are the most important issues uh, for you. So it could be on anything that's covered by transport, so whether it's the things that happen with drones at Gatwick and Heathrow Airport in recent weeks, whether it's your experiences of using Northern Rail, whether it's about buses, whether it's about taxis, anything you like, you can ask <coughs> us about our work or you can tell us uh, what it is that you think. I'll just say, um, as it's probably pretty obvious really, which is we don't speak for the government, so you're very welcome to make your point, but don't expect us to answer on behalf of them. Um, if you ask us a question about something really local that's, you know, something to do with that's happening in Liverpool or on Merseyside, chances are we're not the best people to ask. You'd be better off asking Mersey Travel or asking your local councillor or even your local MP. But we will do our best to give you proper answers or to point you in the right direction if we don't know the answer or if it's not one that we can answer. And obviously, if there are any difficult questions, I'll pass it to one of them. Um, right, what I suggest we do is you, we've got a roving mic, which Debbie's holding, so everyone can hear, and Ed's got one at the back as well. Is if, if I take sort of questions in groups of three, and we'll just try and hear from as many people as possible in the time available. But we do have to wrap up about five, because we've got trains to get back down to London later. So, who, what, just stick your hand in the air if you want to ask a question. Right, so I'm going to take uh, this lady at the front, the gentleman in the nice checky shirt there, and maybe uh, right at the back, the lady right at the back, next to Ed. Is that all right? So let's take you three questions and then we'll try and give you some answers. Four points you want to make. Hello, I'm Anna. Uh, basically, what it is is how can you, my question is, how can you enable more to say people within public transport? give them more access within the community and more freedom? Thanks, Emma. That's a great question. I'll take three questions and then we'll come back. Hi, 
Hi, I'm David Aspin and I'm representing uh, older people uh, today, uh, as uh, are, are some of my colleagues here. And uh, specifically around buses, not so much questions, but um, you'll appreciate we've done lots and lots of work with our older population uh, and feel that we can speak uh, accurately uh, around some of the issues that they raise regularly about local buses. So, to start with uh, a positive, if I may, um, local people, uh, I think, are really appreciative of the enhanced concessionary offer uh, that they receive uh, locally around, uh, around travel. Um, if there was um, a, a number one issue of concern, I guess, uh, it would be what seems to be quite a regular uh, occurral where bus routes are withdrawn by uh, the operators because they're not viewed to be commercially viable. And I think there's this tension always between uh, the services that local people need and, and the commercial needs of the organisation. I think I would couple that with um, a thought about uh, we have a local regulator in Mersey Travel who doesn't seem to have the powers to resist those commercially made route decisions. Uh, and to be fair to them, uh, neither do they have the funding to subsidise all those um, sort of lesser used routes. So, so what we have is a situation where um, the bus services seem to be contracting and shrinking a little bit. Um, and, and dare I say that older people are, are, are perhaps one of the most vulnerable groups in society and can be left quite isolated. Um, there's a perceived lack of services at weekends and evenings uh, from older people. Um, and something fairly new is, I'm, I'm guessing, linked to this idea in the NHS that they are moving towards more regional centres of, of excellence for specific treatments, then that begs a question about how the bus services can cross boundaries uh, and get patients to important specialist appointments, if, if you understand what I was saying there. David, can you wrap it up a bit? Cause I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. And, and my final point, really, it was mentioned in the previous session, this big conversation, uh, and I'm, I was slightly alarmed that the view seemed to be that that is a process that's been and finished. Um, my understanding is that at present it's only been... Uh, online submissions that have been allowed and we've been promised that um, there will be other routes into that uh, big discussion uh, for people like um, our older population who don't have access to <coughs> digital services. Thank Thanks you. very much, really good points and questions. Um, and then right at the back let's have the, a third question and then we'll come to the panel. Hi, um, mine follows on quite well from this gentleman's talk about um, bus cuts, um, cuts to local bus streets, and um, it's to do with um, commercial providers. Um, basically, on the way well, we had um, Avon, which went bust, um, and we were left with no provision at the very last minute. Um, and it's been on lots of routes, and lots of routes that affect up elderly um, areas where there's big elderly population, and also. Um, estates as well um, and it's basically trying to understand what the um, what the duties is of Mersey Travel to, to, to step in because whenever I vote to them they just said there's no money um, and I understand that budget is tight and everything but um, where I live and I know this is getting quite local I live on an estate of over 4,000 people um, forty six percent of people there don't own, have access to a car. Seventy one percent of the elderly population there don't have access to a car, um, and it's um, we have no bus provision now of any of an evening or on a Sunday whatsoever, and that bus linked us to the local hospital and the local town centre, um, and. We, we've just been told that there's no money to provide that anymore. Great, well thanks. Three really um, good questions. If, if I pick up one of the, the issues that Emma uh, raised, which is what can our committee do uh, around ensuring that disabled people can access 
public transport. Well, one of the things that we, we could do uh, is obviously we could do an inquiry specifically into looking at, at those issues uh, around uh, access. But we've already done quite a bit of work asking questions uh, about uh, and writing to ministers and raising with them uh, issues around disabled people's access uh, to transport and particularly how they're trying to improve things. Um, lots of us individually have done things around uh, trying to improve these. Both Daniel and I sat on the bus services uh, committee bill and both raised questions about disabled access, about the provision of audiovisual uh, information uh, on buses, about making sure that the wheelchair space on buses is actually dedicated uh, for yeah, wheelchair. You've got one wheelchair space. Sure. If you're a couple or self support yep. and friends today, you've got 20 minutes gap between each bus, so yeah, yeah, not took and we'll get lost in between. Yeah, so you should be able to go access together. Is it a separate? Yeah. So, so one of the things that we can do is we can highlight issues and then re make recommendations uh, to government, but then it does matter, it, obviously it, it's then for government uh, to take on board what we've said and enact that into legislation. So um, it's a process. Um, those, and, and that's just specific... Sorry. What is getting done at the minute about it? Well, I think there, is, there are some things that are changing. So, for example, making sure that the disabled space on a bus is dedicated it's clear now or it's become it, the government have agreed they're going to make it clear about to make sure that there's not a situation uh, where the bus doesn't uh, you know where if it's got shopping in it or people with with kids in, <coughs> in buggies it's that. not supposed to happen they're supposed to make sure that people move in order to provide the disabled space to the person who's a wheelchair user who needs it so so things are changing but they're not changing uh, necessarily as quickly as you might uh, like. What the committee can do is to ask questions, is to put pressure uh, on ministers to address some of these things. And I recently wrote to uh, the buses minister about many of those issues that David was raising about for older people and difficulties of uh, being able to access health care uh, when they need it via uh, public transport because uh, and Age UK have also uh, done quite a piece of work they called it painful uh, journeys <coughs> highlighting some of those uh, problems so those some of that I wrote as, as the chair of uh, the committee on those uh, issues I think we recognize very much that there's a big issue uh, around access we've picked it up on a number of times in different reports that we've written and certainly we picked it up particularly in the issue, hang on one second, uh, in the issues uh, around uh, the rail timetable changes and how much they had a big impact, particularly on people uh, with disabilities when there was that sort of chaos after Rift the rail. Well. Absolutely, timetable changes. Does, one, does someone else want to pick up the issues around um, bus funding and bus cuts? Maybe you, Daniel. <coughs> Quite happy to. Thank you, Lillian. And thank you for very, very good questions. Some of you will have um, uh, been in the previous session when we were challenging um, both both the bus operators. And it's a fairly familiar story, I'm afraid. I mean, Lillian's much better at being not partisan than I am. But um, I mean, basically, this is down to a political decision by governments as to how much money is going to be spent on supporting communities like yours at the back. And frankly, what we're seeing right across the country is exactly as you said whole areas effectively being cut off, particularly um, early in the morning, late at night and on Sundays. And those of you who were here earlier, there was an exchange with the bus operators. Basically, I would say their aim in life is to return a profit and that's what they're there for. But for most of us, we want a service. And that's what this whole argument is really about. Now, again, as Lillian's pointed out, we're not the government. Actually, there was a some new legislation a couple of years ago, which does give particular areas like this the opportunity to get more control over the buses. And that's what I think the big conversation is about. Now, I don't know the details, um, the point that was made about how people can get involved in that, um, but I, I would very much hope there is going to be the opportunity for everyone to have their say. And I think what I would suggest is the message has got to be a very strong one. That actually what we want from our bus services is exactly that, a service. And at the moment, local councils and local authorities struggle, frankly, um, to have any control over the bus operators. Very different in London, where the system was set up differently when buses were uh, deregulated by Margaret Thatcher back in the 1980s. 
London has been very different and frankly, I think most people would agree, it's a much better set of services. They're <coughs> universal, they're cheaper, and that's why many of us would like to see that kind of system applied across the country. Um, in relation to um, the question right at the back, which was about the collapse of Avon as a, a local bus operator, and the fact that then, you know, what happens is, you're absolutely right, and, and that's not, I mean, I, I'm sure it's, it sounds like a lot of people have been left with no uh, bus service where you describe, and unfortunately, as, as Daniel's already said, that is quite a familiar picture uh, across the country. The amount of money that's put into sported bus service has fallen by almost a half uh, since uh, 2010, and Campaign for Better Transport have looked, and there's probably over 3,500, I think, now from their latest stats, uh, about services that have been cut uh, or withdrawn altogether. And of course, at the same time, you know, local authorities don't have, a, and that's why local authorities don't always have the ability to step in and provide a, a subsidised service, a local authority service, if a commercial operator goes bust or says, we're just not making any money on this route, we're going to cut it uh, back. And, and as Daniel has said, that is a political choice about the, what the government decide to give local authority, you know, local authorities are making those decisions, but if they're getting much less money from central government to help them to cover all the services they provide, that's some of the very difficult choices uh, they're being ha having to uh, make. Can I just say, lots of people sent in questions uh, in advance, and I realise we're not going to get to be able to hear or answer uh, all of them, but what we are trying to do is the staff are making notes of all the questions that you ask, and we've already got the ones that you uh, sent in. Uh, so we are going to write to the local, uh, well, the people who were here earlier, because unfortunately they couldn't stay, so Mersey Travel and the operators. So they will see your questions, so they will know what you've asked. But of course, sometimes you might want to write to your local councillor or your local MP or indeed uh, the mayor to raise these questions uh, directly, because we're not necessarily in the best place to answer them, although it's really useful for us to hear because it might influence what our next inquiries are or what we uh, questions that we might raise in future sessions when we've got people in front of us. Can I take a new set of questions? Oh my, I've got loads. Right, so how about if I take one from uh, right at the, the back there? Yeah, and then uh, another one I can see a black arm sticking up, but that's all I can see. Uh, and then uh, this lady on the second row, please. If you just, I mean, if, you, if you're representing an organisation or whatever, do say, um, you know, who you're representing. Otherwise, just a name, which is nice because it's easier to reply. Hey, uh, I, I'm Matthew. I've, I've got a number of issues really with with uh, the quality of transport at the moment. Uh, the, the main one links to another issue, really, the fact that nearly 80% of people in the northwest are breathing air that's breaching national standards in terms of the amount it's being polluted. Where I'm from, uh, which is in South Ribble. We're, we're, in a we're in a position where we're trying to get people to go use public services to divert from this issue. Well, then when you speak to the local authorities, they say to you, ah, well, that's not to do with us now because that's up to stagecoats, that's up to this, uh, this company. So is, is this committee recommending that we actually lean more towards some sense of public ownership to some degree? I understand that's hard with the current government, of course. But that, that said, we, we are so neglected in the northwest over, over transport. The fact that this inquiry itself says we're focusing on, a, on bus services outside of London. You would never see, oh, we're focusing on bus services outside of Lancashire, as, as, as though that we get enough attention as it is, because we don't. So are the recommendations ready to, uh, to, to deal with these issues? Thank you. Hello, um, I'm John Nicholas. We've spoken a lot about the young and a lot about the old, but I'm one of the people in the middle, and I have about seven smart cards that I carry around with me. Does the will exist with the committee to actually have a smart card that can be used across the country? In other words, it doesn't necessarily have to be a smart card, it'd be a pro it's a product which could also be contactless. Hi, my name is Susan Dykes, I'm from Walton CLP, and actually I was just giving the information regarding the issue of access for people with disabilities. I think this committee could take some lessons from Scotland. I go to Edinburgh where my friend lives, 
and her child had got a disability and used the, um, the public transport all the time with his wheelchair. He has given priority. I believe that is not the case here in this city. And those buses, when they stop and they see him in his wheelchair, no one else is allowed to get on that bus until he, the, the, the bus driver is allowed the ramp to go down. He gets priority. If there's a woman there, there's a mother there with a child in a push chair, if she's not prepared to put the child in, uh, on her knee and go and close up the push chair, she has to get off. The priority is given to the people with disabilities. So that's one thing I think you should be looking at. Also, that is public transport. We are really a private transport select committee, not a public transport select committee, which is the reason why all these people are raising these questions. The other issue I have is with Northern Rail. We've had a dispute in Northern Rail now. We've had 44 days of industrial action, being very well attended and very well supported by the public of this city. Now, I'm angry that the fact that that has not been resolved for the benefit of the public, the, tra the travelling public. We have a rolling stock that's very old. It's inherited from 40 years ago from other cities. There's no investment up here. We are all forgotten. And our geographical area now is being less and less integrated. That's my issues. Okay, thanks. Again, another really um, good set of questions. Um, if I just pick up a couple of things from uh, Susan. One, I think you're absolutely right. It's really important that when we're taking evidence, when we're looking at what's happening, that we look at what's happening in other uh, places and uh, not just other countries within other parts of the UK, uh, like whether it's Scotland uh, or Wales, but actually good practice from around uh, other parts of Europe uh, and the world. Um, as I was saying uh, earlier, in relation to priority uh, wheelchair spaces, that's something that we have been pushing, a number of us have been pushing for for a while, which is precisely what you uh, said, which is that the wheelchair space is there, the priority is for wheelchair users, not for uh, other use uh, on the uh, bus, and mandatory training for, uh, for bus drivers as well to make sure that they recognise the needs of all passengers uh, including those with disabilities, whether they're visible disabilities or invisible uh, disabilities. We're actually, I'm actually leading a, a debate in the House this coming uh, Thursday, which is on a previous report of the committee into rail infrastructure uh, investment. And one of the things that the points that we made in that report was about the, the regional disparity in investment. So loads of money being invested in rail infrastructure in London and not nearly enough in other parts of the country, whether that's in the north or the Midlands or the southwest, um, you know, other places are losing out. And we made that point uh, to government. They didn't really uh, listen enough to other points in our uh, report. And that's why I believed in a debate in the House on uh, Thursday. But you asked two other really, there were two other really good uh, questions out there. Matthew asked about will the committee be re recommending public ownership and John asked about smart cards and contactless. Who wants to pick those up? Graham, do you want to have a, a bash? Th thanks. I, I, I'd like to reply to the, to the lady from Walton as well, if you don't mind. I, I'm, I'm completely at one with everything you've said there. You know, we, we also have the Northern Rail franchise in the North East and those dreadful old Pacer trains and in fact I was out on the picket line with the RMT on Friday morning to show solidarity with them because I think it's a it's a public safety issue mm -hmm. women travelling alone, people with disabilities <coughs> uh, um, families with push chairs if there isn't a guard on those cramped and overcrowded trains how can people safely go about their business? You know, I, I often get the last train back from Newcastle to see them <coughs> and I worry for my life at times uh, with uh, some of the Anti-social behaviour on the trains. I, I I do think it's a it's a question of priorities and you know making a political choice. Um, and you're absolutely right. We, we we are operating in what in effect is a is a deregulated, privatised market that Mrs. Thatcher uh, established. You know when she deregulated the buses, she did that everywhere outside of London, and that's what our inquiry is looking at. And yeah, there are options. And, and Matthew asked if we'd formulated them. Well, we're, we're in the process of doing that and we're trying to do it in a scientific fashion. It'd be helpful if some of the toys would come along. 
but um, you know, we are trying to look at the the options, what works, what doesn't work, and, and you know, let's be honest about, honest about it. The Conservatives believe in the in the free market ethos and the and, and the whole um, idea that the best way to provide the service is a privatised service. You know, but politically, myself and other members of the committee take a different view, and we want to see the service aspect. You know, we're obviously working in partnership with the private sector where that's uh, possible, but it, it, it seems to me it's terribly one-sided. You know, I, I listened, some of you were in to listen to the evidence um, uh, earlier on from the bus operators, l l lovely people I might say, they were very pleasant, and you certainly pay your bus drivers £2 an hour more in Liverpool than the same company does in Durham, but ultimately it's a... Um, you know, it's a it's a voluntary agreement that they uh, enjoin with for this bus partnership. So uh, you know, it, it's it, if you don't own it, it's very difficult to to say how you're going to exert any control over it. So I, th I think we're on a bit of a on a difficult one there. If that's the way forward, I think we've got to be a bit a bit radical and say you know we're, we're going to give a, a greater priority to service provision. I represent an area that has the same problems that's been outlined with lack of, but I don't drive a car and I rely on the bus services and the train services and I have the same problems going to visit my elderly mother on a Sunday and she only lives two and a half miles away. You know, it's, it's outrageous that we're, that we're reduced to this um, compared to where we were uh, just a few years ago. Um, I, um, Smart ticketing, John raised that. Uh, yes, I, I, I'm a bit of a technophobe and I don't believe in digital by default. So I was a late convert to the idea of, of smart ticketing. But now I've seen it in operation where you can get it attached to a, it doesn't have to be a specific card like a walrus or an oyster card. It, it can be any, any, um, any card. I, I can see the benefits to, uh, to that system, and it is possible to offer discounts, uh, and it, it is possible that it improves the punctuality of the buses, because if the driver's not taking money and having to calculate change and so on, then passengers can embark and disembark much more quickly. So there's some positive aspects to that. We, we produced a report that was a bit of a... You know, it's a bit of a geeky report about mobility as a service. If you get the chance, if anyone's interested in that, please have a read of it. Because it puts some ideas forward for the future that I think many people in this room will find very attractive in terms of a coordinated transport system that would meet the needs of everyone, pensioners, young people, older people, and it isn't relying on a purely private sector option. So I'll shut up because I'm losing my voice, Chair. <laughs> Does anybody else want to jump to answer something, Ruth? Yeah, I mean, I'll come in um, on, a, well, a few sort of linked up issues. So I've lived in uh, London for um, over 30 years and been a, a, a borough councillor there before I was elected to Parliament in, in 2015. And I remember as a Labour Party campaigner back in the mid-80s, campaigning against the uh, Thatcher government's deregulation of buses because we predicted back then uh, all of, or many, if not most of the things you've been raising, inconsistent fares, uh, fragility of <coughs> services uh, and routes, particularly where there's less ridership, um, inconsistent standards, um, uh, multiple different ticket options and fare levels, um, etc., etc., um, and uh, even uh, the Thatcher government realised that you could not deregulate it in London, and as a result, uh, we um, since then we've uh, now got the, the London Assembly and the Mayor of London. So the um, our, our f we have a single fare structure, we have a single set of standards. We have a, a fixed routes that don't disappear, um, and um, it also means, in terms of air quality, it means that Transport for London is buying 
uh, and, and or is, is forcing the bus companies and the bus company is still private, run by private bus companies but the uh, it, it's it's a, a, a a franchise it's you know everything about what they sign up to is effectively regulated they have much less leeway um, they still make a profit now obviously because london is so bigger and so much bigger and so much more densely populated um you 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 uh, they make their profits on the sheer volume of passengers rather than the, uh, a profit per, uh, per passenger but um it, it means that the, the mo in order the, the, the most highly polluted high streets, um, including one in my constituency, um, are effectively, in order of level of pollu pollution, uh, are having those bus routes being replaced by hydrogen or electric buses, um, so that we're seeing significant positive impacts on air quality in our most positive, in our most polluted um, streets. Um, now, I think there's... Um, I mean, obviously, it's not my purpose here to, to, to predetermine what our conclusions might be uh, as a committee. Um, but I think there is a lot that um, the other city regions can learn from London, particularly places like Liverpool city region, where you've got lar a large population and, 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 a, and a, a city centre uh, as well. Um, and, you know, the other benefits of... I mean, sorry, the, the, Sadiq Khan's aim is to get a, a greater proportion of Londoners travelling by public transport or cycling and walking. Now, at the moment, um, it's 67, 63% of journeys are done uh, not in a private vehicle, and he's trying to get that up to 80%. And by doing so, the public areas, the central areas, the town centres and, and city centre are given over more spaces given over to walking cycling and buses uh, and less to the less, less to motor private motor vehicles so you know you're seeing that shift but admittedly at the moment the legislative framework is so different that it makes it very difficult for regions such as Liverpool um, region to, uh, Liverpool city region Merseyside to, to, to be able to do that um, so we, we are in we are in a slightly different place. Oh, sorry. On 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 um, ticketing. I mean, I don't I don't see particularly with uh, open access to di to um, uh, data. Um, I mean, and this is a difficulty outside of London. Uh, it's the apps are very because the data is available. You go on your app and you can see which is the quickest way by which different routes and. Uh, um, modes of transport, what's well, the quickest way or the cheapest way or the smoothest way or the most accessible way for me to get from where I am now to where I want to be. Now that requires open access to data uh, and there's some, element, there's some problems with that with the private operators <laughs> releasing data because they say it's commercially confidential, I understand, but um, that's something we're going to have to address. Uh, but in terms of the card, I have one card, I have my credit card my contactless credit card and I use it on everything. If I didn't want to use for various, for whatever reason my credit card, I could have an Oyster card in London <coughs> and that will work on every uh, route and every mode of transport and that has to be um, a, an aim for uh, regions like this I would have thought. Yeah, I mean, I think, as you've heard, there are real frustrations um, about the fact that there's such a different system in London than there is in different parts of the country. London have got different setup in terms of funding and a different setup in terms of powers. And that's why our current inquiry is looking at buses outside of London, because the setup is completely um, different. One of the frustrations, and I suppose you could hear it really in our responses, which is the committee is, our, our reports are powerful and they get... Uh, a good hearing because we're cross-party but equally that makes it more difficult for us to get agreement on recommendations where we might all agree as Labour members but our committee is completely uh, balanced so we're always trying to work towards uh, a consensus and the way that we do that is by taking evidence and sometimes when the evidence is powerful enough we can persuade everybody to say something uh, really uh, influential and important that hopefully government will listen um, that cuts across the kind of, you know, established party positions, but that can be hard to do uh, in a cross-party uh, committee. And so that's one of the challenges of being uh, on a, a select committee, although, you know, you've heard 
the, some of the views of my colleagues here. So let's, should we get another round of questions? Because obviously there's loads of people wanting to get in. Right, so um, what should we do? Well, uh, this lady here, um, perhaps the gentleman there in the green coat, um, and the person sticking out into, with the lady with glasses on her. Yes, there you go, you've got in. In view of what you've just said, do you think that's why we've got no Tories here at the moment? You think they bottled it because they would get uh, somewhat uh, a sharp response from people? Gentleman with the green coat. Hello, Neil Collins. Uh, I've been travelling on uh, public transport in Liverpool for over 70 years, uh, tram and buses, and my experience is that um, the council here are not interested in public transport. They'd rather have cars and taxis running around with the pollution. Um, you contact Mersey Travel and the council and they don't really want to know, I'm afraid, for particularly for elderly people. Um, it's not unusual to have a half hourly service uh, and in my opinion that's uh, in this day and age it's not good enough. Um, and I think cars and taxis should be banned immediately out of Liverpool city centre and then we might get a better transport system where more people will travel on it knowing that they'll run to time. Okay, and there was a lady in the, in the aisle there. Thanks. Hi, um, I'd like to speak about the uh, TRICS report which uh, highways authorities avail themselves of to put in data to um, get to a point where they say, well, uh, you know, that, and it's, it's uh, tricks for those who don't know, it's, it's uh, the trip rate uh, information computer system. And authorities, the highways authorities put this, this data in uh, to assess alongside planning applications as to the viability of that planning application. Um, now, it's, it's you know, your own national planning policy um, w was revised last year, and um, there was an emphasis about with, with uh, traffic, etc., and parking in particular, uh, capacity and congestion. And also there's the ensuring a ch uh, choice of travel, which the various um, councils avail themselves of. And in particular, without reading it all, it, it, when it says about planning applications with regards to tra uh, transport and the parking, etc., it says they have to look at the nature and type of use, the whether the locality in which, excuse me, whether the locality in which the proposed development is located is served by public car park facilities, whether off-site parking would result in demonstrable harm to residential amenity. And finally, the relative accessibility of the development site by public transport. And this, this issue about trips, because I got in touch with the company who does this sort of thing, and he said, he said, yes, you can get that information from your council to see what they put into the information, uh, in, into the data, and that, what data they put in. I couldn't get it off the local authority. But the worrying thing is about it, we decided, and I say me and other residents, decided to get our own independent um, information done by a transport company. And the council said one thing about the TRICS report. This report that we had done by an independent person, company, contradicted it. But we can't avail ourselves of that information that's put into the data. And I think there's a, there's a prevailing thing going on with local authorities. You have to fill a space. You have to fill a space. And it's regardless. And even though there's things I've read out where it, it says it spoils immunity.